Hello everyone from Brussels and a warm welcome to this virtual conference towards an integrated and digital aerospace. My name is Eduardo Garcia. I am the Council Manager of European ATM Coordination and Safety. And today I will do my best to take you through a very interesting session with five top speakers who will share with us their visions and projects on UTM and ATM. First of all, I would like to thank Espodronica for organizing this great event. My special thanks to Isabel Boatas, director and founder of Espodronica, and to her team for all the energy and hard work to make this happen. And also special thanks to all the speakers from Airbus, Boeing, Enaire, Altitude Angel, and DFS for being with us today. Before I introduce you to the speakers, I would like to take two minutes to talk about Canso and explain why we decided to organize this virtual conference about the digital transformation of the ATM industry. So Canso, the Civil Air Navigation Service Organization, is the global voice of the air traffic management industry. Our members support 90% of the world air traffic. In Canso, we work with our members from all around the world to continually improve ATM performance. It is evident that currently the main objective is to recover from the pandemic crisis. And it is equally clear that we should not allow the COVID-19 crisis to stop the innovation in aviation. It is fundamental to assure that the current crisis will not derail the digitalization of ATM, but serve as an opportunity to modernize and further innovate. As the industry association, the mission of CANSO is to bring the world air navigation service providers, leading industry innovators and air traffic management specialists together to share knowledge, develop best practice and save the future for integrated and digital aerospace. Together, we are experts, we are innovators and we are the architects of future ATM. I would like to highlight that in addition to our full members, the NSPs, CANSO associate membership includes organizations that supply goods and services to the air traffic management industry and also to the man aviation. So I am pleased to say that all the companies of today's panel are members of CANSO and some of them like DFS and Boeing play leadership roles in the CANSO UTM activities. So now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers, starting from the left. Mildred Trogela, Director of Global Regulatory Strategy at Boeing. Daniel Garcia Monteavaro, Head of Drone Business Development Department at Enaire. Isabel Del Pozo, Vice President and Head of UTM at Airbus. Richard Ellis, Chief Business Officer for Altitude Angel. And Oliver Pulcher, Director of Corporate Development, International and UAS Affairs at DFS. So we have a structure, the panel in two parts. In the first part, Airbus and Boeing will present their vision for an integrated air traffic management system with UTM as a key enabler to achieve the safe integration of new vehicles and drive the modernization of ATM. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A session with Isabel and Mildred to explore the important role of ICAO in supporting the industry to develop concepts, standards and regulations and achieve global harmonization. In the second part, Altitude Angel and DFS will present their views on UTM and the digitalization of ATM. We will discuss with them the latest draft of the European regulation on UTM, U-Space, that EASA, the European Union Aviation Safety Agency, and the European Commission are currently developing. So now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Isabella and Mildred. Hello, everybody. You can hear us? Yeah. So uh, yes, very happy to be here and thanks to Canso and Expodronica for organizing this event. Uh, I'm going to start with a presentation and then I will hand over to Mildred. Great. So we are actually, as Eduardo just pointed out, obviously trying to um, fly through this kind of um, convulsory times and uh, we cannot forget to focus on innovation because this will pave the way um, not only for us to probably come stronger out of um, the crisis that uh, is resulting from the COVID-19 situation, but also to pave the way forward for our future. And we see it already. It's already there. So there is a growth in new types of operations. We have 
uh, operations that are slightly different from what we are used to uh, as of today. It's not only commercial air transport operations transporting passengers from uh, the different types of airports that we have already, but we see that we have different drones, different EV toys, high altitude sort of satellites, space vehicles, and we have a much stronger mix between civil and military operations, which is becoming stronger um, and interacting uh, between them. So what are we actually facing today? It's not only about the growth in operations, it's not only about the new types of operations that need to be integrated, but we are facing the challenge of the complexity and the capacity limits. Capacity limits, because as we know, um, there is actually already um, um, some capacity constraints, if we go back to usual operations uh, at some um, airports and also at some points of um, our air traffic management system. But the key here is not only the capacity limit, especially the complexity. We are facing new operations that add complexity to the current operations in the sense that we will be flying most probably closer uh, to obstacles above urban environment and this all um, is a huge challenge to be solved in the upcoming um, sorry I'm just <laughs> losing my slides in the upcoming uh, years and we have also a mix of different vehicles different vehicles with different performances there will be an eclectic mix of those types of vehicles which come along not only new operations, not only more complex operations, not only new performances in new vehicles, but obviously also new procedures and new rules that we may need to evolve, that we may need to adapt in the same way that uh, we have to face some ATM constraints, limitations, and also the huge workload that may come upon our air traffic controllers. So if we can go to the next slide, please. That means that the UTM or the US traffic management is not only a priority for Airbus at some point because we need to enable those new operations, we need to accommodate those new vehicles, but also to see how we can evolve the current traffic management to make it safe for everybody to join the airspace, to make it safe for everybody to perform those missions that will also support our economy and develop new business cases. So in total, UTM is actually an industry priority. And we see in UTM a possibility to de-risk certain technologies, certain concept of operations, certain digital services that we may then step by step slowly evolve into ATM. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. The functions of UTM that we deem really necessary and key to explore is obviously the safety risk management. Also, the dyna dynamic airspace management concepts. How are we going to use the different uncontrolled control airspaces? Can we define maybe some um, new airspace types or dynamic um, exchanges between an area which is usually uncontrolled above urban environments, above industrial environments, where we may foresee a much higher number of operations regarding drones, regarding e vitos information and advisories. How are we going to exchange information? Who is going to be the authoritative source for certain type of information? Interoperability will come closely to this type of concept. Obviously, also the instant communication and the coordination. Um, the same references, the connectivity is obviously becoming a key technology uh, break to all these different new operations, new vehicles and contingency management because it's not only an incremental step where we have our legacy operations, our legacy vehicles and we need to integrate these more autonomous operations but um, it will be very important to secure that month and unmanned operations can cooperate, can coexist in the same airspace. For that we need to count with all our stakeholders in UTM starting with general public for public acceptance. Obviously, the UTM service providers, as we see, there are many different service providers, many different concepts on how to set up or defi define a UTM service provider in globally around the globe. Um, this is going to be key to make sure that service providers among themselves can also 
um, exchange or have a proper regulation to be attached to civil and military civil aviation authorities. We see already drone operations in different uh, types for civil and military applications. Our local authorities, obviously our ANSPs, existing airspace users, not to forget that they are already flying, they are already performing the business cases, they are already there and it's not up to them to adapt. It's probably a common effort for everybody to make sure that the airspace is a fair resource that we all can use and push forward into this modernization that we need in order to accommodate these new operations. The operators, of, of course, of the new aircraft, the new vehicles, aircraft manufacturers and infrastructure providers, infrastructure providers which we will need to assess and adapt also to the new concept of operations. If we go to the next slide, please. We will see, sorry, we will see as well that the key points of UTM is actually to be based on a digital infrastructure. We need to evolve our airspace management in order to secure some digital services. Digital services that will pave the way also to include this more autonomous operations, this more automated operations, especially looking into the drones. Innovation base, here is the key. Are we going to make this happen just by an incremental step? of our current air traffic management concepts and way of operating? Or do we actually need a new thinking, new technologies? Can we use already mature technologies in other areas to improve and help develop our air traffic management system, our airspace management concepts? Uh, for example, AI. There are many topics that we believe could be certainly useful and we can use UTM to de-risk them and then safely integrate them step by step into our current way of operating. Operators are evolving globally, so this means UTM is just not a local problem, it's not a national problem. I think we agree that we are in this together, it's in the benefit of all of us, and it's a global challenge and a global topic that we see in the US, in Europe, in Asia, everywhere, and that's why it has to be tackled in a global approach. Next slide, please. As I was um, hinting to during the different slides, if we start at the very top of the interoperability bubble, we need to secure the interoperability between the different service providers, the exchanges of information, the common references. We need to make sure, and this is also the key interest for uh, Boeing and Airbus, not only, but especially from the OEMs, to make sure that it's interoperable with different types of vehicles and different types of operations, and that the different type of vehicles can operate in different UTM systems. We need to secure operations between countries, especially in Europe. We know that we have many different countries and we have many operations that are cross-border. So the interoperability between countries is going to be key in the same way that it is going to be key to make sure that it can coexist and interoperate with existing ATM systems, which is basically the status that we have today and the way we operate today. So uh, passing the floor to Mildred. So Boeing and Airbus firmly believe that UTM must maintain at a minimum the same high level of safety for all airspace users as currently exhibited by airspace operations today. And this can only be achieved if it's built in from the outset. So safety insurance must be considered across the entire life cycle of UTM, from its initial design to its implementation, operation, and eventual evolution. And it's also paramount that we bring a strong safety culture to these discussions. We also consider UTM as being critical to continued safety innovation. So UTM is basically a critical innovation in itself, but could potentially bring about even greater opportunities for safety advancement for all airspace users into the future. So if we move to the next slide, and this really brings me to the key point here. This potential for safety enhancement is a journey all airspace and air traffic management is part of, and not just the small drone community. And this image illustrates that journey now, a picture paints a thousand words, and the big picture being painted here is a phased journey towards a single vision, our common endpoint. There are two key things needed here. First of all, a global agreement on what the long-term vision looks like. 
So the vision is illustrated at the right of the image. And Boeing and Airbus envisage a long-term future for aviation with a single integrated air traffic management system. So this system will stretch from the surface to space. It's an integrated system that encompasses all airspace users, civil and military existing new and emerging ones, as Isabel already explained, and subsequently offering the potential to enhance the safety, efficiency, security, and sustainability of airspace for all airspace users. The second key point here is that we need to recognize that this first steps in this journey are actually occurring today. So achieving our long-term vision doesn't happen overnight. Preserving the safety and efficiency of the existing airspace operation and the existing ATM system will be essential. So pragmatically, it will be a phased journey, carefully controlled and coordinated with the input of all relevant stakeholders. So UTM is our common foundation from which a phased evolution of UTM capabilities and the progressive transition to the existing ATM system will be based. And this phased convergence of UTM and ATM and the progressive expansion of UTM services to a wider era of airspace users and airspace is what we illustrate here. So our journey begins here today where UTM concepts are predominantly being explored and implemented with the needs of the small drone community at low altitudes in mind. But the UTM system is distinct, but compatible with the existing ATM system. With that said, emerging UTM models are advocating different degrees of participation from existing aviation. However, as the number and the capabilities of UAS increase and other new entrants like UAM emerge, there is a near-term need to expand the scope of UTM. This near-term illustrated in the middle of the figure is a period of convergence where over a period of time we see a gradual transition of UTM concepts to traditional ATM systems. So how this transition is implemented is not what's important at this juncture. What's important here, however, is that there will be a progressive expansion of airspace users able to access the safety and efficiency benefits enabled through increasing automation, digitization, and connectivity. The exact timing of ordering of the expansion of UTM is not yet certain. So the important point to take away from this image is that there will be a phased, carefully controlled and coordinated expansion of UTM concepts to an increasing number of airspace users. You will also note that we haven't put a timeline to this. So we know that this convergence is not something we will achieve quickly. But as a global aviation community, we need to develop a comprehensive understanding of the phases, the challenges and resources required to achieve the desired vision. And this is where we see ICAO providing an essential role at international level and the European Commission, SGO, EASA, and Eurocontrol here in Europe. So Airbus and Boeing have also identified a number of key principles that we believe should govern the evolutionary journey we have illustrated, including safety, interoperability, fairness, and cost effectiveness. And this list is not necessarily exhaustive, but provides what we agree to be a sound basis for governing ongoing discussions. So if we now move to the next slide, UTM is being implemented today in a patchwork of different standards and regulatory frameworks. And unless we follow a cohesive global approach, it will result in non-inoperability, inefficiency, and simply a missed opportunity. So to prevent this from happening, Boeing and Airbus recommend to take the following action. So first of all, the development of a global action plan for the development and implementation of UTM with a continued focus on safety is needed. Secondly, we also need to create a global airspace operational concept and standards that incorporate the needs of the existing, but also of the emerging airspace users. It should provide the basis for the development of a phased and operational outcomes and a framework for coordinated regional and state planning and implementation. What we highlighted several times is also the need 
for a unified air traffic management system for all airspace users that facilitates the safe integration of new vehicles and technology. But also states play an important role. So what we need from states is really paying attention to the emerging new airspace users and taking respective actions. So existing plans for UTM should also reflect emerging opportunities, taking into account in particular the interoperability between UTM system, but also between UTM and ATM system. And finally, especially at ICAO level, we need new mechanism for industry involvement and better collaboration between the member states and industry. UTM brings the opportunity, and if implemented correctly, a platform for continuing innovation. And we should look at UTM not in isolation. We need to recognize that the converging journey we are on and identify and safely explore potential opportunities for UTM and ATM together. So if we now move to the last slide, so Boeing and Airbus have a long-standing role at the heart of driving progress in international aviation. And with our underlying commitment to safety, we share a common vision, a future airspace where new and existing users safely operate with a single airspace system. And we jointly believe UTM to be a critical era of continued innovation. UTM will significantly benefit the global community. And it can also serve as a much needed catal catalyst for broader airspace and ATM modernization, which will enable and further foster economic growth and opportunity. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Mildred uh, and Isabel, for your inspiring presentation. Uh, I think we can all agree uh, on, on your vision and the phases that you have uh, described. I personally think that the first steps will be the critical one, ones. And, and as of this, I would like to, to ask you to further elaborate on your call to action. Uh, so it is clear that ACAO has to provide a strong leadership to develop global concepts, regulations, uh, and standards. So, for example, do you see any risk in, for example, Europe or developing a region-specific regulation before uh, this global operational concept for UTM is available? Actually, we don't see a risk there. I think it's on the contrary. Um, it's always good to have uh, certain evolutions. What is key here is the coordination and cooperation. So uh, there is no risk as long as we can secure that whatever is started at national or continent-wise is also shared with the rest of the community. Best practices can be shared and it can be developed together. And we can support ICAO all together from the industry and from the different uh, regulatory bodies to try to um, build the, pro the regulation globally so that it can serve the same purpose, which is to develop a safe UTM that we can all use and where we can all integrate the different types of vehicles and new operations. That's the key. I don't think that anyone has the only single solution. It will be uh, an education for everybody to develop uh, the different solutions, different concepts, learn from them and develop them further. So here, again, as I said, the key is going to be the cooperation and the working together. Yeah, and to add to this, um, I indeed agree that European regulation are maturing well in advance of the likely operational concept or regulatory frameworks from IKEA. But I agree with Isabel that this is rather an opportunity because first of all, ICAO will need to rely on the input of its member states. And I think all what we are doing right now in Europe will be very valuable input to the ongoing discussion at ICAO level. So the lessons learned from the implementation of the regulation should be leveraged to really inform ICAO global UTM framework work and also other regulatory efforts across the globe. 
And I think we we also need to recognize the, the challenge that IKEA is facing at the moment. Given the complexity and the scope of the issues associated with UTM, multiple IKEA panels would need to be engaged in order to even allow um, to further make progress on this topic and to, for example, develop SARPs anytime soon. Um, and I think it's also important to note so that the guidance and the materials that have been released by the ICAO have not uh, have have taken a neutral position and have not sought to reconcile emerging differences between the the regions related to UTM implementation. So there is a lot of work still ahead of us, and I think the focus should be indeed of on coordination and collaboration. And um, I think we need to focus really on bringing both industry and regulators together to um, learn from each other and to work on common solution pathways to actually support the implementation of UTM, also at global level. Um, many, many thanks, Isabel and Mildred. Uh, I can only agree with, with your opinions. Um, I have a second question, more focused on technology. Uh, so do you think that enough testing and demonstration have been done to support the work of ICAO and ANEASA here in Europe? In which areas do you think that more R&D efforts and testing are required to achieve this, this vision? Well, I think so that I think actually we have, sorry, I think. <laughs> Mildred, please. Go ahead. I think Mildred. there's always more we can do. So um, I think in particular further information on the um, demonstration undertaking today is is needed. And so, so individual states and NASPs are already undertaking trials and in some cases um, pursuing implementation of use-based services. Um, the operational models and, and implementation trial conditions and therefore results may not reflect broader EU needs due to, for example, local interest, um, capability and commercial interests of participants, but also the scope of stakeholders involved. Demonstrations to dates have been limited and may not reflect the assumed operational conditions for use-based deployment. So there are no defined, for example, conditions or standards for testing and consistent assist, uh, assessment of performance. And many of the demonstration have not been at scale sufficient to really validate long-term opportunity models and, and assumptions. So there is still a lot more we can do. And difficult is also to compare results as there are differences between the implementations. However, I think um, really a great initiative in Europe is the creation of the EU network of use-based demonstrator because it brings together industry and regulators and really allow us to share our experience, share best practices, lessons learned, and, and to work together to address those challenges. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the use-based demonstration network is really key in the senses you were pointing out, Eduardo, to try to share the different uh, examples, results, um, from the different ongoing projects uh, in Europe. We need this probably also at a more global scale, but there is still obviously room for testing, especially when we go um, precisely on different technology breaks. We all know connectivity is going to be a topic. What type of connectivity are we going to use? As we said uh, before, there is no new type of operation, especially in the lower part of the airspace. There might be connectivity solutions that we can start already deploying that are not the ones that will be needed at a later stage if we go to the very high altitude sort of satellite operations or whether we want to um, transpose or reuse those connectivity solutions later for our usual commercial operations as we know them today. So there is a lot still to be tested, to be de risk and that's also what we wanted to express here. We think UTM is a fantastic opportunity uh, for a testbed for de-risking, for making sure that 
while we secure from a regulatory point of view that um, we push for this modernization of our traffic management systems towards more digital services, towards an integrated traffic management system that integrates the UTM and ATM, we can right now, in the meantime, when we have these different projects ongoing, make sure that we test this technology bricks that we know will sustain there and be the foundation for the future ATM system. We know that we need digital services. So let's start testing digital services with the operations that we can execute today. Let's start de-risking them. Let's start understanding them so that we can secure the deployment later for the rest of the already existing operations, already existing as businesses. That's the, the call to action, the call out that uh, we want also to push with the presentation today. Okay, so as a follow-up, uh, let's stay with you, Isabel. Uh, uh, can, can you name a, a very specific example of how, how you, you see that the UTMs will be used to enhance existing ATM systems? Can you think of a particular example? Uh, well, actually, I can think of many different examples, <laughs> but um, if we consider a particular case of digital services, we know that right now, in order to support drone operations, whether we're talking about drone operations in line of sight, beyond visual line of sight, especially uh, right now, probably in rural areas, we have digital services to support those operations. We have the example of LANs in the US, but we may think, for example, of a uh, uh, terrain and obstacle digital service. That's, I think, a very easy example that we can deploy use today, that we can test, that we can secure. So how is this terrain information going to be gathered? How is the obstacle information going to be gathered? How can we embed it into our digital services? Then test it and apply it and uh, gather quality of service from the UIS operators. And as we know and as we learn, we can adapt that service for later, for example, helicopter operations, which we know they also need a more accurate and obstacle service that can be digitalized, that can be offered to them, that can be deployed them via specific connectivity solutions to the different mission computers or cockpit. That would be uh, an idea, a way on how UTM and existing UIS operations in the lower part of the airspace may even also be supporting and improving current operations um, of existing vehicles. Okay, and, and Mildred, I would also like to hear. Yeah, indeed, there are many, many examples. So, so one example is a tactical flight planning capability. So, um, we believe that tactical capability of UTM to replan, for example, complex trajectory across the network of potentially thousands of, of aircraft, um, the elements of this capability could readily be used for conventional, conventional ATM to support air traffic controllers in their response, for example, to highly uh, dynamic network disruption, such as weather events or, or closed runways. But I think another important area is also SMS. So I think there are a lot of key capability, uh, capability areas um, that we can further explore in order to, to really foster a safety management system for ATM. Thanks. And I have a, a final question, very short. Is, is uh, Of course, I would like to take uh, the opportunity to ask you, how can CANSO better support you on ICAO? Do you have any, any suggestion? Mildred, please. So I think CANSO plays a very important role because you are really the global voice representing all ANSPs. And obviously, ANSPs needs to be part of that journey. And I think the attractive part that you are also bringing to the table is that you don't have a regional specific view, but really the, the global perspective that we ideally also need um, um, at ICAO level in order to further advance the debate. I think um, another uh, way to support us is really providing the platform for discussion. I think what we have presented today is a vision it describes um, an endpoint and it's described a phased journey, but we really need the input of ANSPs 
we need to work together with ANSPs as an important stakeholder in order to make this vision a reality. Isabel, yes, actually, actually, the air navigation service providers are key stakeholders. If for this vision that we just presented, that um, I think somehow has been already several times discussed with many different stakeholders, and it's also shared with different uh, members. But if we don't have the buy-in from the air navigation service providers, then there will be no implementation. So the air navigation service providers definitely are a key stakeholder. And that's why we need to engage and have this fluent dialogue, conversation, lessons learned from what they are already doing, which is managing the whole and the complete traffic and um, trying to see how, and especially as you pointed out at the very beginning, the step-by-step -step integration or this way of, at the very beginning of integrating autonomous operations with existing operations, manned operations, unmanned operations, that's going to be the key and the key for success. If we don't manage to get this um, integration and this transition from the existing system to the future integrated ATM, uh, we would have lost many, many years. So the buy-in from council and its members, it's key. So ma many thanks to both of you uh, for being so open, uh, for sharing your vision with us. Now it's time that we move to the second part of, of the conference, uh, as time is a bit tight. Uh, so in this second part, we will have speakers from NIRE, Altitude Angel, and DFS. We'll, I mean, they will all present their views on UTM and uh, the digitalization of, of ATM. So first of all, I would like to, to give the floor to Daniel from NIRE. Please, uh, Daniel. OK, uh, thank you. The floor you. is yours. OK, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, well. Uh, I expect to for the slides. Well, hello everyone. Thank you, just Podronica and Canso for having an night in this UTM panel. And well, first of all, I like to I would like to next slide, please, Eduardo. Siguiente. Yes. Uh, I would like to make a brief introduction about the NIRE for an international audience that is not familiar with European NSPs. NIRE is the national NSP or air navigation service provider and aeronautical information in is it's the fourth country in traffic volume in Europe. And the Spanish airspace is over a territory of more than 2 million square kilometers that represents 2 million flights and transports more than 250 million people each year. Our airspace is divided in five control centers. Next, please. And uh, NIDA provides air drone air traffic control services in 21 airports, including the five visits airport in Spain, like Madrid, Barcelona, Palma. And NIDA is also the communication, navigation, and surveillance provider in Spanish airspace and AENA airports. Next one, please. What is the NIDA involvement in drone operations? As you can see on the graph about drone operations coordinated by NIDE, there is a trend of the last year with a steady growing of drone operations lab everywhere else, right? Especially in big cities that they are usually, usually inside controller space. The area in red is the period of time when in Spain we had the national lockdown situation where plenty of emergency and surveillance drone flights were carried out. This is one of many examples of useful use cases of drone missions. With this growing trend of drone operations, NIRE, as many other ANSPs in the world, are developing tools to improve and make easier the drone flight approval process and coordination with air traffic services and air drones. Next, please. This is an example, and it's uh, Planea, that it's, uh, well, until US space is deployed and the new European drone regulation applies at the beginning of 2021, Currently in Spain, you need authorization from our national safety agency for many drone missions. In NIRE, we have recently deployed Planea web application where a drone operator can apply for a drone flight with different steps to get the coordinations needed with NIRE, publication of NOTAMs if it's necessary, 
to draw the flight path path on the map, as you can see at the bottom left, and finally get the approval for the operation. But what is the next step? How about the US space or UTM? Okay, next, please. The first night experience in US space has been through the Domus US space project last year. And NIDA was the leader, another 16 companies took part in this project. The Domus scope was the US space initial services, U1 and U2, and in addition, some specific U3 uh, services, like tactical deconfliction, that manages the conflict between drones in case there is a collision risk, and collaborative service with their traffic control system, where is a data exchange between US space and their traffic control system. Domus also addressed a smart city use case and had up to three different US space service providers in the same area. On the right image, you can see the architecture using Domus for US space deployment. The main concept is that the ecosystem manager is the core of the US space, operated by a national entity that could be an ANSP or Air Navigation Service Provider. It handles the critical parts of the system, such as safety, security, and privacy. Below the ecosystem manager, we have a federated approach where each US space service provider is the interface between the drone operator and the ecosystem manager. Each drone operator connects to a USB to, to receive the USB services. The ecosystem manager acts as a proxy, as a firewall between the US space and their traffic control system, as you can see on the left connection. That means that neither the drone pilot nor the USB can exchange data with the ATM directly. It has to be done through the ecosystem manager. Other stakeholders, shown on the right, like privileged users and authorities, would connect directly to the ecosystem manager, for instance, either to obtain traffic information or define temporary non-flying zones areas. Any of you that is familiar with the US space draft regulation or approach was very similar to the idea of the common information service. From a point of view, UTM or US space regulation should be flexible enough to allow any appropriate implementations, in particular those that have been already been demonstration and shown to support open market requirements. And IDA believes that some core, U some core UTM services should be provided by a central information service or themes. For example, it is essential to create a single picture of all aerospace activity on which safe and integrated man and unmanned operations can be planned and operated alongside one another. There is less effort for USB certification. It's a plug and play connection for the USB. USBs are safe and efficiently kept interconnected each other to the ecosystem manager platform for the critical functions. And privacy and secrecy are guaranteed by the state designated common information service. In conclusion, the common information service from our point of view has to be an integrity platform for USB services. And it's very important to set up very clearly the liabilities, responsibilities, and costs to be borne by the different actors in UTM or US space. Next, please. And now for the last part of my presentation, let's talk about how the technology from UTM can transform ATM, their traffic management, in three different phases or steps. The concept is very similar with the graphic that have been presented by Airbus and Boeing. If we don't take into consideration the red arrows, only the left side of the picture, currently any air traffic operation is coordinating the ATM and their traffic control. It's totally human centric. In the first step of UTM deployment, what we call the phase one with red arrows, drone operation will be managed digitally by the UTM system and there will be a limited interaction between the UTM and their traffic part, okay? Maybe only traffic information and some alerts. There will be also a first detection and avoid capabilities with, for instance, the ADSB in receivers in the drone to know about near man traffics that are close. Okay, next. In the phase two, represented by the blue arrows, man aviation that usually flies in very low level will be the first actors that will receive benefits for, for being connected to UTM. Because nowadays, there are limitations in surveillance and communication for that kind of operation, like uh, helicopters in emergency missions, etc. The vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication between man and unmanned 
will have more functionalities, including the interaction between the UTM system and, and the ITM system with full collaborative and bidirectional exchange of information. And finally, in the last slide, we will have the, the phase three, where the full integrations of all actors in UTM and ATM will be mainly, it will be uh, totally uh, integrated. The ATM, the human-centric part, would be mainly for contingency situations. And additionally, there will be connection between different aircrafts. In conclusion, this could be an example of different steps to get a more digitalized ATM and less human-centric. So, next slide is my last one. So, this is the end of my presentation, and thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to be part of the UTM panel discussion later. Many thanks, Danny. Uh, so, before we move to the Q&A session, uh, let's hear uh, Richard Ellis. Uh, Richard is the Chief Business Officer for Altitude Angel. Uh, Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, so, firstly, let me thank you, Eduardo, Canso, and Expojonica for organizing this event. Uh, my name is Richard Ellis. I'm the Chief Business Officer at Altitude Angel. We're on a mission to unlock and to unify the airspace and to enable more people to, well, do more with drones. Um, a core focus for us, like any aviation company, is safety, and we use technology to ensure that drone pilots aircraft pilots, airspace managers, regulators, and even software developers and drone manufacturers can innovate safely together so that our societies and economies can benefit from the drone technologies. The sky above our heads is an amazing resource. If only we could truly utilize it to unlock its potential, and that's what we're here to do. Next slide, please. We're on the cusp of the most significant development in aviation since the advent of the aeroplane as we move towards a future in which drones and UAVs are increasingly sharing the skies with manned aviation. But as drone use continues to rise, what needs to change to truly unlock their potential? There's clearly a strong business case to unlock the drone economy to deliver a wide range of new services, from transportation and delivery to industrial and infrastructure maintenance. Even the future of air, uh, urban air mobility as our cities become airports of the future. Imagine if just 5% of deliveries across the world were made by drones. That's 4.75 billion deliveries annually. And some are predicting taxi and ride hailing UAVs to be making 97 million flights by 2030. Currently, the airspace is highly segregated. And over time, we expect more confidence from regulators to allow more integrated use of our air. Indeed, new emerging technologies will reduce the cost of detect and avoid Furthering, further opening up the opportunities for shared, unsegregated use. Altitude Angel are currently providing national UTM services in the Netherlands, Norway, UK, USA, France, India, and others, proven at scale and integrated into the ATM county, U, uh, county UAS, drone operators and airframe manufacturers, telco and satcom networks, and even with other UTM providers. The technology is no longer the limitation. Indeed, Altitude Angel demonstrated unified airspace management between ATM and UTM more than two years ago at Manchester Airport in the UK with Operation Zenith. And we continue to build on that in our extensive production level deployments, as well as with demonstration projects uh, where we further create innovation to show the art of the possible. Next slide, please. The sky at present is largely quiet given its vast expanse. Annually, there's about uh, 100 million flights. Of course, that was before COVID, uh, but we expect it to return to those sort of levels. And I imagine as a member of Canso, you're fairly invested in some way in the UAV industry, whether you simply like to fly drones for personal use or you're developing airspace for the next generation of flying VTOL aircraft. But together, we have to admit the industry today is constrained. There's so much potential here, which simply isn't being unlocked yet. Operators are literally tied to one spot, able to fly short distances within visual line of sight. The regulations for every country may be different, but they continue to restrict what we can and can't do. And the reason for this is admirable. It's about safety. Next slide, please. Drones appear more and more in the media these days, and happily, it's not just in the science fiction films. We're seeing amazing use cases for the technology. The skies of tomorrow are only gonna get busier. As they do, all the traffic will need to be managed. Over the past few months, we've seen a proliferation of use cases, 
including a rapid increase in the demand for BV loss flights, with testing and trials accelerating in this COVID world. And the benefits are being seen. But drones, of course, will need to share the sky with manned airspace safely and securely. And to scale, that needs to be unsegregated. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Ah, oh, there we go. Thank you. So U has traditionally stood for unmanned, and really it was US, unmanned and, seg and segregated. We're working with ANSPs around the world to open the drone economy and allow operators to fly safely, more autonomously, and for increasingly complex needs. But UTM can be a lot more. As with many things in aviation, the regulators are adapting to these new capabilities, but it's taking time. We at Altitude Angel are working on that. We know the future of UTM is unified traffic management, and we believe the industry needs to support regulators in making this a reality, as we are in the UK, for example, with the Connected Places Catapult work uh, with, in conjunction with the CAA. It's not about them and us. It's about democratizing airspace so we can be, it can be used safely by all. By providing the collaborative digital platform, Altitude Angel is readying our skies for tomorrow. Next slide, please. The future will require unified airspace management. Experienced UTM providers such as Altitude Angel can help regulators, ANSPs, drone operators, manned aviation and other industry players to accelerate the proven foundations and unleash the value of the drone economy safely and integrated seamlessly with the current ATM world. Acting now will not constrain your future potential as the regulations and standards continue to evolve and will allow you to avail of the benefits of the drone economy earlier. This increasingly automated and unified airspace isn't the future, it's today. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And, and our last uh, presenter will be Oliver Pulcher from DFS. Oliver, uh, please, the, the floor is all yours now. Thank you. Hello, everybody from the DFS headquarters in London, Germany. Um, thanks you for having me on this UTM panel with these excellent speakers. My presentation is up in the air, DFS view on UTM, and I try to show you in a nutshell how we within the DFS group are looking at drones and UTM, and of course, what we expect from UTM in the future in terms of modernization and ATM systems. I will look at UTM from different perspectives. Um, first, of course, as an ANSP, that's my core business at DFS, the German Air Navigation Service Provider. As Managing Director of DFS International Business Services, that's an investor in the drone technology startups. And of course, as a co-founder of Dronic, our potential use space service provider in Germany, which is operational since May 2019. But um, let's start first with a brief uh, look how we saw and see the market development for drones in Europe. Next, please. In the past, let's say until 2015, 2019, um, I recall there was an excellent uh, European drone market study, the CESA Outlook study, which predicted the sheer endless potential of drone cases. Two, sometimes three digit numbers of growth was predicted until 2025, 2030. And of course, these assumptions were often the basis of seeding startups and their business plans. And at the same time, we could see that general fear of drones in the public community, low social acceptance by citizens, and a general unknown and uncertainty about the new airspace user drones and its use and behavior. And today, in the present, 2020, well, I think there's still a great uncertainty about the growth potential and Corona leads to shift in necessary investments by enterprise into the next years, which is unfortunate. On the other hand, we see significantly more project experience gained worldwide, but many of these projects still remain on an R&D level on our point of view. There's no real paying customer involved so that you really can figure out what's essential to make it work. There's no mass market yet in a profitable drone business case. Um, we see very good first regulatory drafts from the EC on the other hand, but there's still no holistic picture of how the new airspace users will be integrated safely and fairly. And at the same time, we still see very few BB loss operations on a regular basis. Um, so what 
what's the problem? Why is BBOS flying so important for the UAV market and especially for UTM? Next, please. Well, have a look at this picture. Um, is this BB loss? No, of course not. You can see the drone. The drone is flying within visual line of sight. Most companies using drones still operate this way. And one thing is clear, you don't need a comprehensive UTM system for this kind of drone operation, do you? Next, please. Next, please. <laughs> OK. This is the real BB loss. I know the drone is fulfilling its mission, surveillance, delivery, etc. This is exactly where the real potential of drone use cases persist, flying out of sight, automated. At the beginning of 2020, our Dronic asked potential UTM customers, and of almost 100 companies in Germany, 85% said they would like to do and fly BBLOS today, but only 12% are currently able to do so, and only under very limited conditions. There's a lack of regulation, lack of technology, lack of UTM. So how can we increase this rate of BBLOS application? What kind of UTM is necessary for that? Next, please. Well, we need a holistic UTM system that enables safe and efficient drone BB loss flights. Here on this chart, you see greatly simplified, of course, you can see the core elements of our UTM system. Due to lack of time, I don't want to bother you too long with details, and it's much more comprehensive if you deep dive in the technology. But an integrated UTM ecosystem with connection to the ATM world is really a complex technology matter. By this chart, you get hardly the feeling for it. But for sure, you need first, when you look at the um, points 10 and 9 on the bottom right, a core UTM with an interface to ATM. Second, you need various interfaces to locate the position of the drone. Um, you can see that on 1, or 7, 6, or 2 on this slide. Hopefully, you can see that. Um, because the visibility of the drone is, is the key thing. Um, and the situational awareness of all stakeholders in these airspace is a key. Third, um, customers and companies generally expect real-time data transfer. They don't want to fly for the heck of flying. They want to immediately process the information and receive it during the flight, for example, via mobile um, technology. You have to integrate the interfaces to the drone operator via app, by integrating in a ground control station, or even already integrated in enterprise systems. Uh, picture um, a flight mission planned via a SAP system. So on the other hand, you have the authorities, the security agency that need the processes for automated approval, mission, geofencing, and so on and so on. So you see, UTM is not just an app or a map. It's um, a lot more comprehensive, and I'm sure everybody here in this call and watching this has already known that. Next, please. So at DFS, uh, we recognized this complexity of the UTM system five years ago. Um, we at um, DFS, International Business Service, that's the non-regulated uh, commercial branch of DFS, was started five years ago to establish partnerships and cooperation. So, what my um, speakers already said in this panel, collaboration is key. We established these partnerships uh, along the UTM value chain. We have a leading UTM technology provider, that's Unifly. We have a leading mobile, mobile communication provider, that's Deutsche Telekom. And in this combination, then we created Dronic in 2019. In 2019, um, Dronic started this operation, will be our future USSP service provider in Germany and competing with others in this German market. Since collaboration via the UTM value chain is uh, key for, um, in our belief, Dronic has consistently expanded its cooperation network, for example, in the area of hardware, for drone tracking models, there's a company called Aerobits, a company called Air Avionics, which delivers uh, GBARS systems, a Unique, a leading drone manufacturer for professional drone use, Sky drones, and others. And we are convinced at DFS that these UTM functionalities, processes, and data must be scalable and integratable right down even into the drone. So what can DFS learn from this UTM experience for ATM? Will it disruptively replace ATM revolution or evolution? Next, please. Well, let's look at 
ATM today. Where are we today? Let's remember the important discussion we had in the pre-corona area. But the key issues from a more or less technology perspective is we've seen fragmentation. Still too much fragmented um, ATM systems across Europe. There are a variety of ATM technologies out there, different approaches, still a large number of system interfaces within the network. Complexity. Overall, the technology and the innovation processes are perceived as too long, too complex, too slow. Normal cycles take about seven years. That's not unusual. Limitations, as speakers before me already said, there are limits and barriers within the ATM system, just to name a few. A lack of scalability of today's ATM system, in the pre-corona times, congested bottlenecks, delay, capacity problems, ADCO, mobility, flexibility, and so on. And in the end, all this leads to costs, because it is expensive, this network. But on the other hand, we as NSPs, together with Kanzo, we know the necessary set of screws to resolve this. And that's why we are working hard together in Europe to achieve rapid improvement with Kanzo, Caesar Deployment, SJU, Eurocomputer Network Manager, and so on. So as I said, and my speakers before, collaboration here is key to improve the ATM system and learn from UTM. Next, please. So how do we envision the ATM of the future? It should be scalable, resilient, flexible, green, cost efficient. I want to give you three examples from a technology point of view. In the ATM software development, less V model but more agile software development with concrete results in terms of productivity in less time. Second, ATM architecture, less distributed databases, silos, and numerous interfaces to more cloud-based systems, software as a service, data centers, and API-driven uh, API modules. And just for picturing the controller workshop positions, today, composition of different screens and modules and in the future, hopefully, integrated controller working position based on an optimized HMI with a higher degree of controller system tools and automation. So let's come back to the key success factor talking about ATM and UTM integration. Next, please. For us, the key factor of ATM and UTM integration is visibility. It's the visibility of all airspace users. A central and complete picture of who is flying where right now and why is essential for safe operation for all airspace, uh, airspace users. It has always been in the ATM world and it will be in ATM and UTM. Not only for drone to drone, as it is often discussed, therefore, from our perspective, you see the role that's been discussed in the EASA U space uh, draft regulation of a central and national common information service provider as a key element. And we believe that an AMSP is ready for that to take that up, that role, with integrated digital and automated solutions. Next, please. Last but not least, as I said, what do we expect from the other draft regulation? DFS and ANSPs, as an ASP, is a potential common information service provider. Donic can be a potential use based service provider, and they are ready for integration and for integration of new airspace users. The technology is there, it's functional. We can do it. But we don't see um, an added value of several um, common information service provided in one state. I think the UTM ecosystem gets far too complex when there are too many points of truth. There only should be one, one national um, common information service provider. So um, I'd say let's make it not too complicated. The market needs pragmatic solutions right now, and it's not the time to try to anticipate all the potential realities that we probably see in 2030, 2040 in the regulation right now. We need an agile, pragmatic use space regulation in Europe, and then take it from there, learn, learn from the drone industry, learn from the customer, and if we should adopt it, then change it. And with that, I believe ATM can learn a lot from use space and UTM, and who knows, maybe in one or two decades, we see a merger of ATM and UTM. So this, in a nutshell, is our view on UTM. Um, I hope it was interesting. Thank you for your attention. and happy to discuss our views with you. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Uh
very interesting presentation. Uh, we have now a bit of time for a Q&A session. I think uh, all of you have mentioned the US-based re uh, uh, regulation, which is being developed here in Europe by EAS and the European Commission. So I would like to hear from you, what, what is uh, your general view on the latest draft available on this uh, regulation on, on US space? Do you think that it will deliver the expected uh, objectives? I, I'm also particularly uh, curious to know if you think that uh, segregation at, as it is proposed in the current drafts based on this uh, dynamic uh, reconfiguration of the aerospace is, is the right way uh, to move forward. Uh, what do you think? Uh, so let's let's now start uh, from uh, with uh, Daniel, Richard, and then Oliver. Mm -hmm. Please, Danny. Okay, I think. Okay, I think there are like three questions uh, regarding to the latest draft regulation. Uh, I think from an idea that have been improved, especially the articles referring to US space services that have been clarified and removing the restrictions or limitations uh, of the common information service uh, well in the former famous article 5.6 sorry uh, the match version i think that sets up um, a new space framework more realistic and closest to the current deployments in several countries along europe uh, without negative impact in safety or, or a competitive market deployment uh, I think that there is still some work to clarify some points that are not clear yet, like man aviation operating in, in US space, uh, for instance. Uh, related to the question of the expected objectives, I think that the most important thing is to get a regulation to have an initial deployment of US space. And it's not going to be easy because uh, you know that in Europe we are still in the transition period of the European drone regulation. I mean, the, the 945 and 947 from last year, and to adapt your space with other regulations like 373 and CES 2+. Plus. So I think it's going to be a real challenge for, for regulators and, and to us and the commission. And so I think that it's not about to get the expected objectives, but when we will achieve them. That is, uh, it's more a worry in that in the time, in the timeline. And about the segregations, uh, well, uh, according to EASA, until further development of detection and avoid system for all air space classes and operational concepts, uh, well, they apply for for the segregation. But I think that there have been a few BLDs, a few very large demonstrations where real time information of drones and other aircraft have been shared, and there was cooperation between US space participants. So maybe the solution is to find something similar to uh to my colleague from dfs said is to find a new concept of operation where man and man aviation can be if not integrated at least accommodated in in the in the first part and if their position are known uh, i always insist on the plenty of use cases uh, with drones at airports that are going to be more difficult to carry out uh, if the airspace has to be continuously changing dynamically to US space, to conventional space, and again to US space. So, so uh, that, that's my view. Thank you, Daniel. Richard? Yeah, I, I mean, firstly, it's great to see uh, momentum building uh, in the industry, if we go back a few years, there was virtually no regulation around around this space. So, actually, seeing us get to a a foundation level that uh, has been agro uh, agreed across so many different member states, uh, and uh, and also, I, I think it's been very good to see the regulators listening to industry, um, as Danny just mentioned, seeing the uh, the adaptation of the the famous clause five point six, um, and many mm -hmm. other points within there. Uh, which really to getting the feedback from industry, but this is still just a foundation. So, um, you know, my our, our view is that uh, we need to get people flying. The more people fly, the more we'll learn, which will help then uh, lead the the future regulations. And uh, you know, the uh, your 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 question around segregation, uh, I think we made it quite clear in my presentation, we believe things should be unsegregated more, not just in controlled airspace, but it is already unsegregated outside of controlled airspace in many ways. So let's think about this as a broader industry uh, way of bringing things together. I mean, today, a helicopter takes off from a private site and someone's flying a drone nearby. 
they don't necessarily communicate or see what's happening, but the technologies are there to, to allow it all to uh, be coordinated. The technologies are already there to allow <laughs> ATM to see what UTM sees and vice versa. So my view is let's, let's get on with it. Let's let people fly and, and then continue to learn and continue to evolve through some uh, demonstrations that will gather the extra data for the next level of safety case. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Oliver, ca can you elaborate a bit more? Yeah, uh, I can only say I totally agree with what um, Daniel and Richard said, um, get the people flying, <laughs> that's when we learn from it. Uh, but from a DFS ANSP point of view, as I already said, we stand for a safe and fair integration of drones, and we do not think that segregation is the appropriate approach in the use space regulation. And as the EC draft points out, that segregation will be the first step. Our question is, um, how will segregation efforts will disappear once they are established? And um, we don't think that's the, the right way. Of, uh, on the other hand, uh, we are convinced that with the existing UTM solution that we have and the right equipment for tracking drones at all levels, uh, the integration is already possible. So um, get an easy, accessible, affordable tracker technology like hook-on devices or lips and what they are called and make everybody visible and it should be feasible um, at least within Germany or the national state. Um, Cross-country cross operations um, may, might be a different thing. From a use space service provider perspective, such as Dronic is, I would say they feel comfortable with fulfilling the mandatory services as an USSP, but they have other pain points. They have the pain point of timing. Um, the regulation still needs time, the approval, the national implementation needs time. And we were wondering um, as a potential USSP, is that attractive for a market within the given training? And um, there are two new institutions, um, a central um, information service provider of PIMS, uh, how it was called a couple of months ago, um, a CEAA. So how are these um, new institutions work together, uh, correspond, what's the cost structure? And um, since the use space service provider are at the customer front desk, they fully rely on these institutions. So. Um, this is, let's say, from a market point of view and from a startup point of view, um, the essential points of what we expect from the, from a, um, the new use space regulation. So agile, quick, first get the people and the drones flying. Okay, yeah. So, so I think we all agree that this use space regulation is just a, a first step, uh, that it will need to be abated. Uh, uh, it is clear that, uh, of course, we will need to develop the acceptable mean of compliance and guidance material for all these regulations. Uh, and I think I have heard it several times from you that more testing and demonstrations are, are required. Uh, so so I, I would really like to know from you in which areas, which key technologies you think that they need to be tested, they need to be uh, improved. Uh, so please, now starting from Oliver, uh, can, you, can you share with us your views about uh, key projects maybe that you have in mind? Well, we, we did um, testings with over 30 customers flown over 2,500 kilometers of BB loss on tests and trials. I think the um, testing cannot be enough um, and there has been done a lot um, be it with the demonstrator projects and so on. Um, but the real testing starts when you talk with real customers that are about to pay for the services and, and really want to get this operation, their, their enterprise operations done by drones. And then you see the insights. So I can only recommend uh, to share views with real, real time and realistic cases um, on, on testing. And of course, one crucial thing is the visibility of all airspace users in very low level um, in, in, um, in the airspace G and the um, equipment, um, the inter interaction with the drone, with the ground control stations, as I already said, is crucial. So uh, I think with the real customers and making the drones visible and visible to others, um, and maybe another aspect, we've been tasked at DFS to, to um, 
um, come up with drone detection system at our international um, airport. So we, we, we're highly testing right now drone detection systems and the interaction with UTM. Um, so I can recommend this, and I think these are the crucial steps that uh, have to be taken. And not, not more sandbox testing and showing that it's essentially working, you know, um, real time. So, Richard, what do you think? Uh, I, I concur with uh, everything that Oliver said there. Um, I think there is a, uh, you know, the demonstration projects are great because they gather uh, and, and give people conviction that some of these services are getting to a level of maturity that they can be put into, into production. But it, but it only ever shows the true value when you talk to the real customers. So I think there could be uh, more demonstration projects. There is also uh, private, in private industry uh, demonstrations that go on um, uh, for BV loss activities. Um, but the, uh, the need here to uh, further the, non uh, the unsegregation of the airspace is, is key to uh, enable um, true operations to happen with industry uh, operators, the, the people who are actually going to buy these services at the end, so that we can validate the commercial models as well as uh, convince the regulators to unsegregate the airspace. And I think there's been a, a lot of um, money spent in some of the demonstrations that really are, uh, you know, not about moving the industry forward and testing the limits, but sometimes just to fund relatively inexperienced companies to try and catch up. So I think, you know, let's take it get the real customers involved rather than just the, the industry people and let's go make it happen. Okay, Danny, what, what do you think? Okay, I think that from the customer point of view, there are plenty of services uh, that have to be developed. Um, I don't know because uh, there are so many things that have been deploying and evolving like the 5G communications, lot of concept, like lots of link, uh, lots of energy, lots of GPS. There are so many things that the customer, the real customer needs uh, for a real operation. And we need, uh, well, I agree uh, with my both colleagues that a few European demos has been held and, and it's needed, it's needed uh, to do more because we need to gather more information for, for everything that the, the operator needs. Uh, to gather information in different working groups of standards, for instance, and requirements. And I think that it's plenty of material already. We have all over the world fantastic professionals, very important technological companies. Uh, but I think that the biggest challenge is that there is little effort available uh, from the industry, for instance, in Europe, maybe to, to support EASA or, or the Commission uh, to you know, to, to carry out or, or, or to develop uh, what, what everything uh, it's needed in the in the drone operation. Okay. Many, many thanks. Uh, we are now uh, uh, running out of time a bit, but but we before we, we, we finalize this Q&A session, I would like to ask you the same last two questions that I have asked Mildred and, and Isabel. And these are just, if you, uh, the three of you could just name an example of uh, UTM system uh, technology that you think that can be used in the short term to enhance existing ATM systems. And also if you can just, uh, uh, you have an idea about how council could better support you or us and the commission. So now Richard, please, if, if you can take the floor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, I think as with uh, what we heard from Airbus and uh, Boeing, many, many examples of how UTM can help uh, integrate and, and move the uh, ATM forward. Let me give just one example is integrating flight strips. So if you're asking for permission for a flight, does it have to be done completely separate for UTM to ATM? Why not integrate it into the flight strip management system? This has been done. Uh, another one is automating approval. So understanding where uh, safe automated activity could take place or uh, uh, and, and therefore the, the approvals can be a lot easier and quicker for the industry. If they have to delay flying for a couple of days because they can't get approval, it can cost thousands of pounds. So having that sort of speed of interaction and, and knowing where they can or can't fly 
uh, is going to be quite important. I think the other piece um, is around uh, an airport where taking integrated views of the whole county UAS system, the main radar feeds, the UTM system, uh, and various other conspicuity methods and getting one view of all of the available sensors so that uh, you know safe operations can continue in an integrated fashion uh, is, a, is another great example. Um, and then just to uh, slightly tongue in cheek, but uh, from Canso, I think you're doing an amazing job of taking the feedback from the industry and influencing the regulation. The one ask from me would be to change the uh, the statement at the beginning from about the furtherment of ATM to being the, that of furthering unified traffic management. Point taken. Okay. Oliver? Well, it's kind of hard to, to, to add on that because uh, Richard and um, Boeing and Airbus already pointed out crucial by sense of things. I, I, I totally agree with flight script, automated approval. That's the, that's the core of, um, uh, of UTM systems that you just push a button via an app and get an approval, draw your, with your fingers on your map where you want to fly and so on and so on. Maybe that map issue, a 3D model of, of the airspace is something, but mm -hmm. uh, also behind the technology, there's a lot of things, um, cloud-based solution. Um, uh, yeah, and, and so I, I think there are tremendous um, um, elements where ATM can learn from, from UTM. And as I already said, all, already the, the software development process, how you approach and UTM development is a different kind of how we approach ATM system development, um, at least in the past. So uh, I think there are a lot of things that we can learn. Um, concerning Canso, well, um, I can only say you did a great job in Europe, um, bringing everybody together on the We Are All in One Sky initiative. Uh, what can I say? Um, I, this is exactly how I, as an ANSP and a potential new partner of Canso as a USSP, um, think an um, association should work, bring the people together, bring them, harmonize the positions and, and confront um, or work together with the regulators so that we have the um, level playing field that we need to foster this market. So um, really excellent job in Europe and of course globally. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. And, and uh, Daniel, you have the last uh, chance to, to, to talk, please. OK, OK, I agree with me with my colleagues. And um, for instance, uh, the implementation of, of something that the UTM can help the, the ATN. Uh, well, some examples have been already said, but but of course, uh, the digital communication between their traffic controller and, and operators that eventually will not talking to machines, not, 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 to, not to persons, but, but to machines automatically. Um, for instance, another could be the concept of demand and capacity balance that we have in, in US Penn are very similar in, in the ATM no? that can be applied to, to flight routes to change immediately, uh, dynamically, depending on the needs. Uh, that, for instance, for the uh, for the conventional air traffic airlines, uh, we would have a huge saving in fuel. Uh, for instance, that, that I think it, it's, it's very important. Um, well, about Canso, uh, I think everything has been said. Uh, it's, it's crucial, I, I think, um, and for an IDs, it's very important uh, to have Canso participating in meetings and working groups uh, related uh, to this topic uh, today, the, the US space, for instance, where the ANSPs uh, can be here uh, for the UTM deployment uh, and, of course, comply with safety, security, privacy, uh, and neutrality of data. That is the ANSP uh, point of view. Canso has a wide spectrum of air navigation service providers, including the industry. Okay, um, and I think that. It's a very important organization uh, to work with ICAO, uh, for instance, a um, um, very crucial and um, a good job. A good job, it's, it's all I can say. Well, uh, again, thank you all uh, for all your feedback and, and, and nice words too. Uh, we are reaching uh, the end of, of the conference and I would like to uh, 
to explain a bit something that, that Oliver has mentioned, the initiative, we are all one in, in the sky. Um, so I, I think this is something that has been hi highlighted several times uh, during this conference. Uh, air traffic management has significant uh, potential for further embracing uh, digitalization. This is a topic, a top priority for the industry in order to facilitate the safe integration of all new vehicles, uh, drones, supersonic aircraft, aerospace, sp space vehicles, and more, and also to contribute to a greener, safer, more efficient, and more secure air traffic management. But in order to, to, to do this, to make this vision integrated uh, and digital aerospace a reality, it is essential to work all together. NSPs, regulators, states, airlines, airports, industry suppliers, drone manufacturers and operators. So as of this, I think I would like to mention this initiative, We Are All One in the Sky. It was launched a few years ago by IATA, the European Cockpit Association and Canso in Europe. I believe it is it's a good example of this all-inclusive and cooperative platform which aims to facilitate in the integration of drones while protecting the, the safety of, of the, let's say, traditional aerospace uh, users. So uh, currently, the We Are One in the Sky platform is composed by 18 uh, as aviation association, and it's fully open to everyone, to all the commercial and drone operators and manufacturers, everyone uh, who is in, interested to, to participate in, in our discussions. So please do not hesitate to contact me or get in touch using the email that appears now on the screen to know more about the, this initiative or about the, the council activities on, on UTM in general. So with these last remarks, uh, I would like to once more thank Expodronica uh, for all the efforts, thanks all the speakers. I have found all the uh, presentations, uh, of course, full of content, full of visions. I think we, we all uh, can reflect on everything that has been said during this one hour uh, and a half. We have a lot of ideas to, uh, that need to be progressed. Collaboration, again, is key to achieve this vision that I think we, we all share, uh, listening to all these panelists, to have this integrated and digital aerospace. In Europe, of course, we are now waiting to see the new proposal for the single European Sky 2 Plus. Uh, that will be also uh, be, be key to move into this direction. So with this, uh, I would like to close this virtual conference, thanking all the audience for, for listening. Stay safe and healthy. Uh, goodbye, and and hopefully see you soon uh, soon next time in in person.